Jurassic World Evolution 3 has a pterosaur problem. Broadly speaking, it actually has an aviary problem. Um, we could really spend this whole talk just discussing all of the many, many issues with the aviary system in the game, but I really just want to focus on the animal. So we'll speed run some of the basic problems with the aviaries real quick. Uh, one very notable thing, just a really strange design choice, is the fact that aviary nests can only be placed in aviaries, but the nests stay behind if the aviary is deleted. So with a small workaround, you can place a pterosaur nest outside of an aviary, essentially at will. Uh, so, so why have to have the workaround, right? Why not just allow that sort of thing to, to happen directly um, within the game? Furthermore, regular nests can't be placed in aviaries, and aviaries can't be built over them. These feel like arbitrary restrictions. On top of all of this, the aviary terrain in general is barely editable. Um, this, this picture here shows what I'm talking about. You get five contours of terrain height, essentially, that are available to an aviary. So you can't dig down beneath the base level of the aviary, and you can hardly raise the terrain up inside of it. This, this massively limits what you can do with the game's new terrain tools. It just highlights how, how, how aviaries are left in the past. So yeah, I just want to touch on that real quick. The meat of this discussion is going to be the pterosaurs themselves. So, while the aviaries are very disappointing, the pterosaurs are also very disappointing. To me, that is the bigger issue because the animal is the most important part of the aviary as an exhibit. Um, behaviorally, the pterosaurs we have are very, like, copy-paste. They have essentially the, the same behaviors uh, across the entire spectrum what we have. They all hunt goats, then people. They all feed from fish feeders, which is what they require for their uh, environmental comfort. And there's really no good reason for this consistency across these different animals. Uh, pterosaurs in real life were, were extremely successful animals that were present across a range of environmental niches. They, they had a whole spectrum of different variations in their body plan and diets. And there's no good reason not to have these in the game. We're going to go through like the most egregious things first as far as like the issues with the in-game pterosaurs. And then we're going to take a look at the entire roster at the end. So, the most egregious one, I've railed on this uh, many a time in stream and with the previews in GW3, is the Tapajaras. We have, we have two of these in the game. We have Tapajara, and then we just received the brand new animal at release, Kahiwajara. Um, and, and these animals are, are very distinctive with, with like blunted, short heads, and this is uh, giving them a profile and a beak structure that's very parrot-like, which applies kind of a convergent behavior with parrots, right? These guys have beaks that are shaped in such a way that they probably share the same kind of diets that, that parrots have. Um, so probably herbivory. In fact, we actually have a fossil that shows this, Cynopterus. Um, this, is a, this is a top of jar with fossilized gut contents that show that it died with a belly full of plants. Now, you could argue, hey, maybe it died because it, its belly is full of plants, but that's gamer behavior. Uh, no, it... it, it <laughs> You've got plenty of anatomical evidence that these things ate plants, and now you have an actual fossilized example of this thing eating plants. Uh, this thing ate plants, probably. <laughs> you can never be entirely sure without a living example. But, like, this this game is also not a documentary, right? So, so JW3 benefits from adding diversity to the animals, from extrapolating a little bit on uh, the paleo record to enhance the gameplay, right? And the the thrust of my argument here is that the gameplay suffers when there is no reason for it to suffer because the paleontology actually supports diversifying the gameplay, right? So top of jarids should be herbivorous, fruit-eating animals. It would match what is thought about them from the paleo record and would improve the diversity of things in the game. This extends further. We have the Asdarkids. These are thought to be terrestrial hunters, like storks, kind of, like, like stalking along the landscape you know, stabbing down with their beaks and eating little things, often associated in paleo media as uh, uh, th those things they eat being delicious, delicious babies. Um, so these also should not be piscivores, right? These things already hunt goats. All they really need, the fundamental change here, is just make their, their environmental requirement be a goat feeder and not a fish feeder. And you've literally, you've done it. <laughs> like, right now there's no reason to put a goat feeder in there. If you just removed the need for a fish feeder and instead changed it toward, toward the goat feeder and like maybe drop the water requirement low, then you would have this more terrestrial themed aviary setting in as dark habitat apart from the other pterosaurs in the game. 
Uh, very simple. It does not take much effort. If you want to go a step further, you give these things like a unique terrestrial stalking animation where they, they use their giraffe-like body plan and they actually walk more as they're hunting down the goat instead of just the usual swoop down and kill, which would, again, give them a different vibe. If you made these guys spend more time on the ground, particularly when feeding, they feel different than the other pterosaurs instead of just being a bigger version of the other pterosaurs. Going beyond this, we have the pteranodon. Uh, in Jurassic World, we see these dive into the Mosasaur Lagoon, and in the Dominion Prologue, we see them dive uh, into this river canyon or whatever. Um, and this is actually thought to be true to real life. These things were probably divers. They dive into the water to, to hunt fish. Um, so why not reflect that in game, right? It's true of the franchise. It's true of real life. Why is it not in the game, right? We added deep water mechanics so that we... TW3 introduced very few animals that actually interact with the deep water mechanics. We could expand on this by adding in Pteranodon as an animal that can use that. Have it actually physically, have an animation for it to actually dive into the water and catch fish that way. Remove the fish feeder requirement, like Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus has no fish feeder requirement. It only needs the deep water. That makes it a very unique animal to put in your park. Do the same thing for Pteranodon. Remove the fish feeder requirement, add a deep water requirement, Give it a diving animation. Done. You've made an animal that's that's very unique. That's great. But, you know, there's other pterosaurs that need similar reworks. So, to discuss that, I've generated this figure here showing the phylogeny of all the pterosaurs in JWE2, JWE3, and uh, Neurognathus, because that's almost assuredly coming in a Rebirth DLC. And this phylogeny diagram is color-coded. In the green, we have the animals we currently have in JWE3. In the yellow, we have the animals that are guaranteed to return because we've already been told they're coming back. In the orange, we have the animals that were in JW2 and are not yet scheduled for release in JW3, but are almost assuredly coming at some point. And in red, we have Neurognathus, who we can safely assume will be introduced to the game. So you see this, this whole relationship between all the animals in the game. And the point of this, the point I'm making here, is you can draw some very clear-cut divisions amongst these animals. So what I did with this phylogeny chart is then I broke it down by dietary types. So, so this whole chart is made based off uh, primarily paleontological accuracy, but also considerations for things in the, uh, the franchise and the film franchise. And thankfully the film franchise doesn't really contradict uh, paleontology in this case, with at least the diets and like feeding behaviors of these animals, right? There's other, you know, of course the film franchise isn't, remotely paleo accurate overall, but in this case, it doesn't like make any egregious errors. Uh, essentially, the, the diets follow the phylogenetic bracketing. So the breakdown here is basically that Dimorphodon, as an animal, uh, was probably hunting like small lizards and small prey like that. So Dimorphodon in game should probably be uh, a meat feeder animal, right? It should be a Piscivore because it was not Piscivorous. It shouldn't be a, a goat hunting animal. It shouldn't have a prey need because the goat is much bigger than the animal itself. Since there's no like lizard, small lizard feeder or whatever, uh, it makes the most sense for this to be eating from meat uh, in game. That would make it consistent with the other small carnivores that also probably primarily hunted things like small lizards, uh, terrestrial carnivores that is. And then we have the, the Cyrodactylus, the Tropognathus, and the Marodactylus, these like Ornithochirids. These stay fish eaters. These are probably like surface skimmers, which to me, the, the surface skimming feeding strategy is most analogous to eating from a fish feeder in the game. Um, so those can remain unchanged, I think. That's perfectly fine. And then we have Pteranodon and Geostrombergia, very closely related animals. These should be the deep water animals, the divers. Uh, splitting off from that, we have our one uh, Nyctosaurid, Barbarodactylus. I'm not entirely sure if uh, what the feeding habits of these guys is supposed to be. I don't know if anybody's entirely sure, but these seem to be um, animals that are more specialized for staying aloft. So they're probably also a, a surface skim feeder. You wouldn't expect an animal with that big antler coming off the back of its head to be diving into water anyway, right? Pteranodon's a little more streamlined, Geostrombergia less so. So you can believe, you know, in terms of like structure, it's believable that those are diving. Barbarodactylus doesn't feel like he would do it. So I left Barbarodactylus here as a surface skimmer, so just an animal that eats from the fish feeder, um, which I think is perfectly fine. Then we have our Tapajara, it's Kahiojara. Tapajara feeding off of plants. And then we have our two Asdarkids, Quetzalcoatlus and Thanatos Dracon with goat feeder. 
Uh, and then we have the early split from the Tapajara as Darkid line, which is the Sungaripterus, and any other, you know, the Sungaripterids or whatever that group is called. Um, and these guys are, are again, another pterosaur with kind of a unique beak arrangement and skull shape, probably adapted for eating hard food like crabs, um, other, other things like that, like shellfish, stuff like that maybe. Um, so I put it down here as like a, potentially it could have a unique crab feeder. Probably not worth implementing. If anything's a pipe dream, it's the idea of like a crab feeder just for Desungaripterus. But it would be kind of neat if, if you had just like ambient crabs crawling out of the deep water and Desungaripterus would like land on the shoreline and like eat the crabs or something. Pipe dream, pipe dream. Desungaripterus, as far as I'm concerned, can stay a fish feeder animal along with the other four fish feeder pterosaurs on the chart. But if we really want to push this into like, you know, full dreamland territory, then we do that. We make him, he, he eat the crab. Uh, and then finally, we have the Geolopterus and the Neurognathus, or Neurognathids. The Geolopterus was introduced into JWD2 alongside of an, an insect feeder. So it had a unique feeder that only it used where it released insects and you would see it swoop through the cloud of insects and like grab a bug and eat it. Uh, great. Fantastic. Insect feeder doesn't exist in JWE3, uh, but it really should. I'm, like, at a base level, the insect feeder should just be something in JWE3, and it should be uh, a feeder that other animals can use. Have, like, the small scavengers be able to eat from it, have the ornithomyamids eat from it, um, and, and, you know, that adds some more, you know, behaviors and diets to the terrestrial animals. We're not talking about them here. But at the base level, like when a Norognathus is added to the game and Geolopterus comes back, these should use the insect feeder from JWE2. It's accurate to their diets. It adds variety. It's just a good thing. People like the insect feeder. Uh, part of the reason they never use the insect feeder in JWE2, well, they, uh, again, in JWE2, past the, the release of Geolopterus, is they said, oh, well, we don't, uh, this, is a, this is a DLC thing. We can't have a separate DLC use a component from another DLC, right? You'd, you'd have to buy this DLC to specifically be able to use the insect feeder in this other DLC. Thing is, that's bullshit. That, that's complete bullshit. All you do is you put the insect feeder in the free update and you make the DLC animal use the free update feeder. This is basic. <laughs> There's literally no obstruction to doing this. It, it's, it's a complete, like, like cop out or excuse so uh if they brought back the feeder they really do need to make it a uh, part of like a free update a base game thing so that it can be used on new upcoming releases it being specifically a dlc feature was very dumb and should not be repeated um and the thing is we can actually implement some of these changes already in the game a mod has done this uh Tapajarid herbivory has been modded into the game and making the Asdarkids require uh, a prey feeder, have a prey need, has also been implemented. Uh, that, that one's very obvious. It's just simply changing a, a metric in the game data table so that it looks for a feeder instead of looking for a, looks for a uh, goat feeder, a prey item, instead of looking for a fish feeder. Um, the Tapajarid thing, probably a little more involved. Um, and, and, you know, the other argument you can make is, well, the mod exists, just use the mod. Well, the mod does not live up to the standards of the game. The top of shards don't actually have animations for using, for eating from plants, right? To properly implement top of jared herbivory, you would actually want proper feeding animations. Which is work, sure, but it's not much work. And it's work that really should be done. Because it feels very, very lazy to not make these animals herbivorous um so yeah that's that's kind of the whole thrust of my argument here we have an opportunity to make the pterosaurs in gwe3 uh much more interesting and diverse and in turn that improves the aviaries because instead of you building every aviary the same you put a big lake in the middle you plop down one or two fish feeders and then you check who needs trees and who needs rocks and you put those in it's very dull but if you implement these different diets you can have these very visually distinctive aviaries even if you're only building to meet the base needs of the animals because by giving them these different different um feeding methods then you put in these different things in the aviaries instead of it always just being centered around like a fish feeder 
uh, it's just a good opportunity. It's like a good first pass almost at improving the aviary system and making it a little more dynamic and interesting. And so that's, uh, that, that's my talk. Thank you for coming. Uh, see ya.